Exodus 12, verses 1 through 5. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, they must select, must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's households. One animal per household. If the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each person will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. May Yahweh bless His word to our heart today. So we finished chapter 11 last week and we discussed the final plague. The past two lessons that I've taught, we've discussed the final plague that was to come upon Egypt. The plague of the death of every class or status of firstborn male. And today we begin in Exodus 12, which teaches us the remedy to that final plague. And the remedy was what we now call the Passover. Through the keeping of the Passover ordinance, the Israelites could escape the judgment that came upon the land of Egypt. The plague would not come nigh their dwelling if they observed the Passover the way that Yahweh commanded it to be observed. This chapter, Exodus 12, contains the most details in regards to the Passover than any other chapter in the Bible. So we'll go through this chapter verse by verse to better understand this appointed time. Because it was not just a one-time event. That first time was great, and it was probably greater than any other Passover ever to be kept. But this is not just a one-time thing. This is an event that Yahweh wanted His people to memorialize every year, year after year in the future. So today, we'll cover Exodus 12, 1 through 2. It says again, Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of your year. The month being spoken about here takes place around what we call the springtime of the year. This month is named Abib, or probably more properly, Aviv. It's named this in the next chapter. In Exodus 13, verse 4, it reads, Today, in the month of Abib, you are leaving. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, reads a little bit differently. In Exodus 13 and 4, the translations that I have say, On this day you are going out in the month of new grains, or for on this very day you are going out in the month of new things. The word abib means ears of grain, and it refers to barley that was harvested in the spring. Abib, the word abib can mean brand new, fresh, newly formed green ears of barley grain, or larger ripened ears of barley. The word ear of grain is an old English word that stems from an Indo-European root word that means to be sharp. And it refers to the spike of the grain. The month of Abib is the month in which the first fruit offering of the barley harvest was in succeeding years lifted up and weighed by the priest according to Leviticus 23 verses 9 through 11. And this ceremony was to be done during the days of unleavened bread which directly followed the Passover. The best explanation and translation I have read for the word abib was by a friend of mine named Adam Drissel. I would encourage everybody to read Brother Adam's study. In his study on the new year, he presents that the word abib is best understood as not a particular stage of barley, but the shooting forth of the ear from the stalk. He cites Bible translations and Hebrew lexicons that give to sprout or to shoot up as definitions for what the barley does as it forms ears of grain. He then links that understanding with Scripture and verses like Exodus 13 verse 4 would be understood this way. Today in the month of the shooting forth of the barley, you are shooting forth out of Egypt or going forth out of Egypt. I think that's an excellent understanding. The same holds true for other texts, Exodus 23.15, Exodus 34.18, and Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. All say the same thing. Today you are going forth in the month of the shooting forth of the years of barley. And that's when you're going to leave Egypt. Now, but how is this month determined or figured? 
What is sometimes missed in Exodus 12 verse 2, just by the casual reader of the Bible, is that it's a calendar verse that harkens back to Genesis 1, 14 through 18, where Elohim says that the lights in the heavens are to be used to determine time. In the HCSB, Genesis 1, verse 14 says this, And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for festivals and for days and years. If we took away, hypothetically, if we took away the crops or the harvests or agriculture, things like barley and wheat or the fruit from the fruit trees, time would still exist. Time is not relegated to planting or harvesting crops. But if hypothetically we took away the lights in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars, time would stop to exist. We would just be in a vacuum of nothingness. No day could be told apart from the next. For days as we know them would not even exist without the heavenly lights. Same goes for the weeks, the months, and the years. In Exodus 12, verse 2, we read, This month is to be the beginning of months for you. It should be understood, though, as this moon is to be the beginning of moons for you. The Hebrew word there is the word hodesh. And it's defined by various Hebrew lexicons as meaning either one, the new moon, or two, the lunar month, the entire lunar month. Hodesh is used interchangeably in Hebrew Scripture with the more literal word for the orb of the moon. And that word is Yerach or Yareach. Both pronunciations are in the Hebrew text. These words are actually the same consonants with just different vowel points. It's the same words. I believe it's Yod, Resh, and He in Hebrew. One example of the interchangeable use of Hodesh and Yerach is 1 Kings 8 verse 2 where it says, So all the men of Israel were assembled in the presence of King Solomon in the seventh month, the month of Ethanim, at the festival. Now when we just read that in English, it doesn't seem very significant. But in Hebrew, the two words for month are different words. That word month in the phrase the seventh month, that's the word chodesh, the word translated either month or new moon in the Old Testament. But the word month in the phrase the month of Ethanim, is the word Yerach, which literally means the orb of the moon. So the word Yerach is used in texts like Deuteronomy 33, 14, Isaiah 60, verse 20, which speak of both the sun and the moon. But Yerach is also used in texts like Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, where it says that Miriam hid her child, who was later named Moses, in the basket, as she pushed him there down the river. But before that, she hid her child, And it says that she hid him for three months. That word month is not Hodesh. That's Yerach. She hid him for three moons. Why does it say three moons? Well, because the Hebrews, their months were determined by the moon. They were not just arbitrary. They were lunar. Just as the Hebrews looked to the moon for determining their months, they looked to the sun for determining their years. The Hebrew word for year is shana, or shana, and it refers to a revolution of time, in particular, a revolution of the sun. The sun makes the biggest rotation of all the heavenly lights. It's about 365 days in length. And inside of those 365 days fit 12, most often, or sometimes 13 moons or months. The Hebrew calendar is then not just lunar, it is solar-lunar. With the sun being the great light and the moon being still in Genesis, the moon is called a great light. Yahweh made two great lights, but the moon is the lesser light of the two. And then, I'll get into this in here in just a little bit, we could also add stellar in reference to the stars. Solar-lunar-stellar calendar. For example, we need both the sun and the moon for determining our days. The sun tells us when days begin and end with its rising and its setting. But how do we know that one day is different from the next? How is today different from yesterday? 
The answer is the moon. While the sun teaches us the beginning and ending of days, the sun does not tell us which day we are in. The moon does that. The moon tells us which day we are in by changing of its shape each night as I believe it reflects various light portions off of the sun. So the sun and the moon work in harmony. They're not against each other. They're harmonious. And they work in harmony like a husband and a wife should. Just a few weeks ago, Brother Dan read Genesis 37 in our Torah reading. And Joseph had a dream. Joseph was a dreamer. Well, Joseph had a dream that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to him. And as soon as he told that dream to his dad, Jacob, Israel, his dad said, Shall your mother, your brothers, and I bow down to you? See, Jacob Israel knew that the sun, S-U-N, was typified of himself. And that the mother was the moon and that the eleven brothers were the stars. So any calendar that dismisses the sun or the moon is divorcing the heavenly marriage, the heavenly husband and wife. The sun and the moon help show us that both the husband and wife have necessary and important roles in Scripture. Because the sun is likened unto the man in Scripture. The moon is likened unto the woman. So just as we have beautiful marriages here on the earth, there's a beautiful marriage in heaven of the sun and the moon. Of course, I'm speaking metaphorically. And they both help in telling us about time. So when we read or when we see the word year in Exodus 12 verse 2, it is the first month or moon of your year. That word year is tied to the revolution of the sun. The sun has four turning or pivot points in the year. We call them now, the ancients didn't call them this, but we call them now spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, and winter solstice. At the spring equinox, the days and the nights are about equal around March the 20th, and the sun rises due east, and it sets due west. At the summer solstice, which is about June 21st, you have the longest day of the year and the shortest night of the year. And the sun still rises in the east and sets in the west, as the old timers taught us. But that sun actually rises the furthest northeast, and it sets the furthest northwest. The word solstice is taken from the Latin language the word soul means sun, and the word, the last part of the word comes from the Latin word sistere, which means to stop or to stand still. And the reason that we call it the summer solstice is because at the time of the solstice, the sun looks like it's rising and setting at the same place, rising in the northeast, setting in the northwest, for about a week or even more in a row. It doesn't move. It appears. It barely does, but from the naked eye, it appears like it stops. Then you move to the fall equinox about around September 22nd. And again, sunrise due east, sunset due west. That's the middle of the illustration there. And then after that, you have the winter solstice. That's about December 21st. And that's the shortest day and the longest night of the year. That's where a lot of the Christmas traditions come from is old winter solstice traditions. Uh, longest night, shortest day. Ancient peoples would watch the sun's path to determine these times. Now, each point is a marker for a new season of time. And since we've established that the springtime is the beginning of time, according to Yahweh, the spring equinox, what we call the spring equinox, is the best marker in the sun's path to determine the new year. So from spring equinox back around to spring equinox is about one solar year or one solar revolution. Now, the Hebrews called these markers tekufa. That's the singular, or tekufot would be plural. A tekufa refers to a particular pivot point in the movement of a heavenly light. This is a cool verse. Psalm 19, 1 through 2, reading from the King James, says, The heavens declare the glory of Elohim, and the firmament, that's an old fancy word for the sky, showeth his handiwork. And what do the heavens declare and show? Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth forth knowledge. 
What that's talking about is what the sun teaches us by day and what the moon and the stars teach us by night. They teach us and they speak to us about telling time. Verses 4 through 6 say this about the sun. In them, the firmament, the sky, he hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Those are two references to sunrise. What the psalmist is saying here is that when the sun rises, it's like a bridegroom that comes out of his chamber. He's excited. A strong man ready to run a race. He's excited. It continues by saying, His going forth, that's the S-U-N, the sun, His going forth is from the end of heaven, and His circuit, tekufa, that's the Hebrew word tekufa, unto the ends of it. King James and the more literal translations of the Bible will place that second word ends there in the plural. Then it goes, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And here we see the word tekufa used. It's used to describe the point of sunrise from one end of heaven to the point of sunset at the other end of heaven from the east to the west. So, for about 15 years in my life from 1998, 1998 was the first year that I ever observed Yahweh's feasts. From about 1998 to 2013, I believed that the best way to begin the scriptural new year was to take the first new moon after the spring equinox. For example, the spring equinox occurs about March the 20th. It can actually happen March 19, 20, or 21. It occurs about March the 20th. So if a new moon happened on March the 19th, I would wait 30 more days and I would take the next new moon as ABIB 1. So this particular example on the screen would put ABIB 1, the new moon, first new moon of the year, right around April the 20th, and then another 14 days was added to that to get to the Passover. And using this method, Passover would sometimes fall in the month of May. In 2013, after more research and new material that I wasn't aware of, I became convinced in the winter of 2012 to 2013, I became convinced that it was not the new moon after the spring equinox that was of greatest importance, but instead it was what old commentators call the vernal full moon or the spring full moon. So if the new moon fell on March 19th, I would now take that new moon as the first of the year and Passover would fall roughly around April the 1st. So I came to see that the criteria was for Passover to be held in the new spring season. So you could at times take a new moon before the spring equinox and you would still hold Passover, which is right around the full moon, after the spring equinox. And when you take the first full moon after the equinox for Passover, when you count down seven months to the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles will, will either overlap the fall equinox which I believe is the best way, or excuse me, it'll either overlap the fall equinox or come shortly after the fall equinox. I believe that's the best way to obey Yahweh's command in Exodus 34, 22, where he says that the Feast of Ingathering occurs at the Tekufa of the year. I'll talk more about that in a bit. One thing that convinced me of this was studying the use of the zodiac in ancient Hebrew astronomy. Now, do not be scared by the word zodiac. When I first heard somebody use the word zodiac in a Bible study, I thought, okay, people already think I'm strange enough. I don't need to study this because they're going to think I'm even stranger. But I ended up studying it because that's what truth seekers do, right? We look into all avenues of what people are telling us. So the more that I studied the word zodiac, I began to not be scared of it. And even the word astrology. Now, I'm not saying or condoning things like horoscopes. I don't believe that we should look to the constellations in order to predict our future or see if our life is going to go the good way or the bad way. I don't believe that at all. But the word astrology is simply made up of two Greek words, astro and logos. Astro means star and logos means the word or the speech. It's the speech or the word about the stars. Astronomy is astro and nomos, which means the law. Nomos is the Greek word for law, the law of the astros, of the stars. So astronomy, astrology, and the word zodiac, I'll get there in just a second. 
Some people think that the zodiac is pagan, but listen, pagans did not create the stars or the star patterns. They may have misused them or abused them to their own fault, but they didn't create the star patterns. Remember, the stars are mentioned in Genesis 1, and the 11 stars are mentioned as bowing down to Joseph in Genesis 37. Remember, Joseph said his dream, I saw 11 stars bow down to me. Why 11? Well, that stands for his brothers. And when you count Joseph, that makes how many? Twelve. The twelve signs of the zodiac represent the twelve sons of Jacob, Israel. The word zodiac comes from the Arabic language. You know what it means? It just means the path or the way. And it refers to the path of the sun in the sky as the sun travels through each constellation throughout the solar year. The sun spins about 30 units or 30 days inside of each constellation and it creates solar or we might say stellar months. I then began to see things written by old Hebrew historians that lived, Philo actually lived some in the B.C. era and Josephus was born in the first century A.D. And they linked the Passover with the sign of Aries the ram. And you have to be careful here because if you don't understand something that's called the precession of the equinoxes, then you won't understand that the stars actually shift or move about one degree every 72 years. And I know a lot of this is deep. A lot of this may be technical. It's actually not that technical when you understand it. It's very simple. But if you're hearing it for the first time, like I did one time, it goes right here, right? So I have a lot of this in written form and in sermon form where you can go back and you can read and take more time to study in detail. But these two historians linked the Passover with the sign of Aries the ram. Now anciently, anciently the sign of Aries was from about March the 20th to April the 20th. And the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the lunar month, the moon of Abib, while the sun was in Aries. Both Philo and Josephus mentioned this. Now, what this did to my view back in 2013 was backed Passover up to where it could not fall any later than April the 19th or the 20th, but no earlier than March the 19th or the 20th. It all depended on where that full moon was in relation to the spring equinox. Uh, Did you realize, a lot of people don't know this, but the Christian holiday of Easter falls on a different calendar date every year. And the reason it does that is because of the vernal or the spring full moon. Now I have a whole series on YouTube, six videos that are about 30 minutes a piece in length, where it talks about how we got from Passover to Easter. And Easter is in part celebrated based on a solar and lunar calendar. Now, there's a little Gregorian, Julian mixed in there because they celebrate it on what what day? Sunday. But it's the Sunday that comes after the first spring full moon. You can watch that series if you're interested more about that. So, for my first 15 years of my walk with Yahweh, first 15 years, I was completely convinced that the new moon after the spring equinox was the best choice for the new year. And I will just tell you, honestly, I felt like I would never change on that subject, on that topic. But seeing new information back in 2013 and changing on something that I held firmly to for so long, I remember when I saw it. (laughs) I remember studying one morning. And the reason I saw it, Yahweh obviously is the ultimate reason, but the reason I saw it was some studies that Brother Arnold had given me and some studies that Brother Adam Drissel, the guy I mentioned before, had given me. And I remember I was comparing some things. I was looking at Philo and Josephus. I was looking at some ancient Christian documents in what's called the Anti-Nicene Fathers. And I remember when the light bulb went on. And I saw something that I had not been able to see for 15 years. That I had studied off and on for 15 years that I couldn't see. And when I saw it, and you know, when you see something, um, you, you have to walk into it, right? When you see something, you've got to walk into it. Well, when I saw it, It humbled me and it showed me, it it renewed my mind that we have to always be willing to be open to new information. Or we have to be willing to look at old information with fresh eyes. Sometimes if we set something on the shelf for a while, meditate, think, and then take it back up off the shelf and, and read it again, sometimes we can look at old information with fresh eyes. After all, truth seekers should only want truth. Amen? 
We should only want truth. We should not be concerned with the traditions of men, whether Christian traditions or Jewish traditions. We shouldn't be concerned with either. I remember one time a fellow was trying to get me to get involved in some things that were Jewish traditions in regards to the feasts and things like that. And it just never set well with me and I never was able to accept it. And I remember telling him after I thought about it for some time, I said, look, I, I dropped certain Christian traditions, man-made traditions. Not all tradition is bad. As long as the tradition doesn't violate a commandment or as long as the tradition is not held up to the same level as a commandment, then the tradition is fine. I have some own traditions in my own life. I don't teach them as law. I don't really even teach them, but I have traditions in my life. But they don't violate a commandment and they don't, I'm, I don't elevate them to the status of a commandment and try to teach that you all need to follow the traditions of Brother Matthew. If I did that, you know what this would be. This would be a cult if I did that. So we're free thinkers here. We think for ourselves. We, but we shouldn't be concerned with Christian tradition or Jewish tradition. I told this guy, I didn't drop Christian tradition, man-made, to then go over here and adopt man-made Jewish tradition. I want the Scriptures. I want the Torah. I want Yahweh's law. I was talking to a sister the other day and about the Passover, and um, she said, you know, it's hard to find somebody that observes the Passover without all of the Jewish traditional trappings. But that just goes by what the law says in Exodus chapter 12. And I concurred. I told her that it was. But my point here is, is that even when we hold tightly to a doctrine, we must always realize that there may be something we are missing. Putting these notes together reminded me of that this week. So that even when I'm convinced of a position and I strongly hold to that position, I need to at least keep one ear open <laughs> to a further understanding. I heard it again the other day. Somebody said that the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. Right. Then she added, and two eyes as well. So we have two eyes and two ears. That counts to the number four to where we should see things and listen to things a whole lot more than we talk. Made so much sense to me first time I heard it and it still makes so much sense to me now. So for me in the past... My first month of the year would sometimes span April and May, <clears throat> but that's too far. Now I realize that it always spans March, April. It can begin early March at times, or it can begin early April at times. And then sometimes it can begin right in between. Now, moving on, I'd like to go back to Exodus 12, 1 through 2, and I want to ask a question. Why did Yahweh tell Moses and Aaron that this month of Abib would be the first moon of the revolution. Some scholars think that the new year is changed here from autumn to spring. A lot of scholars actually think this. Not all. Those that don't think this are in the minority. Most scholars think that the new year is changed here from the fall of the year to the spring of the year. These scholars believe that the original order of Hebrew months began around the fall equinox instead of the spring equinox. And they will cite a few verses in the Tanakh or the Old Testament in an attempt to prove this. Now personally, right now in my studies, I'm not convinced of that. I'm not convinced that the original creation began in the fall. I've considered it. I know where they're coming from. I understand the arguments, but I can't see it right now. I lean towards the year always beginning in the springtime, even at creation in Genesis 1. I believe it began in the spring of the year. Two big verses that are always brought up, though, in an attempt to prove that the months originally began in the fall are Exodus 23, verse 16, and Exodus 34, verse 22. Now, Exodus 23, verse 16 says that the festival of ingathering, which, if you study the Torah, festival of ingathering is another name for the Feast of Tabernacles. Same feast, two different names. It says here in 23 and 16 of Exodus that this feast is to be observed at the end of the year. I've got it underlined on the screen. They reason that if tabernacles is at the end of the year, it must be around that same time that another year is beginning. One year ends, another one begins. Jewish scholars sometimes call this the civil year that begins in the fall or the autumn. And that's opposed to the sacred or ecclesiastical year that begins in the spring. Kind of like we have a new school year that begins in August or September. It used to begin in September. I think now it begins in August. 
But yet, we also have a year in America that begins in January. So, school year and a regular year. Civil year, ecclesiastical year in the minds of some Jewish scholars. But the word end here in Exodus 23.16 is the Hebrew word yatsah. And it means to go out or to exit. And I think that it's best to understand this as the going out of the agricultural season. Or, I think this is how I understand this best right now, the going out in the sense of the last half of the year. The coming in of the year begins Abib 1. The going out of the year happens Tishri 1, right around the time of Day of Shoutings, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. Thus in the spring, it comes in. First half of the year in the fall, goes out last half of the year. I think that's how I understand Exodus 23.16 currently. Well, then we have Exodus 34.22 that also says the Feast of Ingathering is at the year's end, reading from the KJV. But this time the Hebrew word is not yatsa; It is the word tekufa, that word we looked at that refers to points in the path of the sun. And in this text, I don't believe it's talking about the end of an entire year. I think that the tekufa here is talking about the fall equinox. Philo, the Jewish historian that lived before, during, and after the time of Christ, Philo actually cites this text as speaking of the fall equinox in at least two places that I found this week. One in Special Laws 2 and another one in the book of Flaccus. So the end of the calendar year is not in view here, but a turning or pivot point in the year is at the fall equinox. One of those turnings in the year. And other translations of the Bible actually say turn of the year. Holman Christian Standard, Lexham English Bible, New American Standard Bible all say the turn of the year instead of the end of the year. And the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, helps us here because it says not the year's end, it says the middle of the year. Now when you first read the Septuagint, You think, well, that's contradictory. If one says the year's end, Septuagint says the middle, that contradicts, let's throw one of them out. But most of the time, I've been able to find harmony between the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Septuagint text by noticing that they're coming at things from different angles. And I think what the Septuagint means here is it's referring to where at in the entire year we are. The Feast of Tabernacles is actually kept right around the middle of the year. But the Hebrew text is centering on a pivot point in the path of the sun, one of the sun's tekufa or tekufot during the year. Now it is true that Josephus does mention another new year in his work. This is the oldest mention of what Jewish people call the civil year that I have been able to find. Josephus states that Abib was appointed by Moses as the first month for the Hebrews festivals because they were brought out of Egypt in that month. Quote, so that this month began the year as to all the solemnities they observed to the honor of God, although he preserved the original order of the months as to selling and buying and other ordinary affairs. End of quote. That's from Antiquities 1.3.3 in the works of Flavius Josephus. Once again, this is a Jewish historian that lived in the first century A.D. If you don't have the book of Josephus, if you're a student of the Bible, you need to get a book of Josephus. It's very, very complementary to the Scriptures. Now, what I want to note here is that Josephus could be just giving his understanding when it comes to the original order of months. Sometimes when we read Josephus, he tells us how thousands and maybe millions of Hebrews did things. There he's not just giving us his opinion or his understanding. Other times, though, he may be giving his understanding on doctrine or on the original order of months. Josephus believed that the original order of the months began in the fall, but that does not mean that all Hebrews believe such. Philo seems to believe that the order of months in Genesis began in the spring. He states in Question and Answers on Exodus that, quote, of the equinoxes, it was not from the fall one, but from that which happens in spring that Scripture begins to reckon time. He continues by saying, Now the season in which the world was created, as anyone will ascertain in truth who uses a proper method of inquiry and deliberation, was the season of spring. End of quote. Now, one person could argue, well, what about if Philo was just giving his understanding? I would agree that's what he's doing here. I just agree with Philo's understanding. Because I don't see any evidence in Scripture that the creation of the world took place in the fall. 
I've always found it unsettling that many Jewish people call the seventh new moon Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. But it's never given that name in Scripture. I remember back when I was a teenager and I first started studying these things and I heard everybody say, Happy Rosh Hashanah. And I thought, okay, well, it's a Jewish feast. I'll keep Rosh Hashanah. But then I got to studying and I couldn't find that the seventh new moon, the seventh new moon on the calendar was ever called Rosh Hashanah. But Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. The name given to this day in Scripture is Yom Teruah. Yom is the Hebrew word that means day. And Teruah means like jubilation, loud noise, um, a beautiful loud noise. You can make on a trumpet. You can make it with your voice. You can make it on a guitar. You can make it with a loud sounding cymbal. But that's why I call it the day of shoutings or the day of joyful noise. That's the name that Scripture gives this particular new moon. And in Leviticus 23, it's called the seventh new moon in the law. It's called the seventh new moon. It's never called the first new moon. As a matter of fact, Exodus 12 verse 2, our primary text in this sermon in the Hebrew actually calls the month of Abib Rosh HaShaneh. That's Rosh Hashanah, Abib 1, the head of the year. Some people have asked me the question, Brother Matthew, why then do you believe that creation is memorialized in the seventh new moon? Because I've taught sermons on Yom Teruah, and I believe that on Yom Teruah, on the seventh new moon, what we're memorializing is the creation of the world when the sons of Elohim shouted for joy and applauded the handiwork of Yahweh, Job 38, 1-7. My answer to that question is that the seventh month in Scripture is somewhat a mirror image of the first month in Scripture. For example, track with me here. We observe in this congregation the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month in the fall, right? In the fall. Hallelujah, He didn't tell us to observe it in the winter. <laughs> Or in the summer. Amen. I wouldn't want to be in that tent at the summer solstice. <laughs> May, May, <laughs> that's the amen corner. <laughs> so we observe tabernacles in the seventh month in the fall. But, meditate, think about this. What are we memorializing when we observe tabernacles? Leaving Egypt. Where the Israelites had to dwell in temporary shelters when they were in the desert. When did they leave Egypt? Not the seventh month, in the first month. But Yahweh has us memorialize it in the seventh month. Other mirrors can be found like the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is on the tenth day of the seventh month. When is the Passover lamb selected in the first month? Tenth day. See, they're a mirror image of one another. There are some things that Yahweh calls to be memorialized in the seventh month as a mirror of the first month. Does that mean that the creation of the world began in the fall rather than in the spring? I'm not convinced. I remain open. But I'm not convinced. So why did Yahweh tell them when the first moon of the year would be in Exodus 12 verse 2? Why did He say this is going to be the first moon of the year for you? I agree with what Philo says on this matter. He states in questions and answers on Exodus that the statement in Exodus 12 verse 2 makes, quote, clear a determined and distinct number of seasons lest they follow the Egyptians with whom they are mixed and be seduced by the customs of the land in which they dwell, end of quote. I think what Yahweh was doing here is telling the Israelites, His people, in a fresh way, because they'd been in bondage to the Egyptians for so long, that we're not going to do things the way Egypt does them. This is going to be the beginning of months for you now. Historical evidence shows that Egypt actually began their new year in the summer rather than the spring, around what we would call June or July. Yahweh was saying, you're coming out of Egypt. Your year is going to start now in the month that you are leaving rather than later in the summer like you learned from the Egyptians. What about January? Let me say here that a new year in the spring makes total sense. But a new year in the winter, as we have in modern America, doesn't make any sense. Not only is it not scriptural, it just doesn't make sense. In the wintertime, everything lays dead or dormant. There's no new growth. The leaves fell off the trees in the autumn. The sap goes down in the trees during the winter. The ants go away. The bees stop buzzing. It's cold. The days are short. So if you nudge me at midnight on December 31st and say Happy New Year, I'm going to say, does it make any sense, brother or sister? Just doesn't make sense. So why do we do it? 
Well, there's only one reason. A tradition of man in honor of an old Roman deity named Janus or Janus. See, the Roman calendar, the actual Roman calendar, originally had lunar months. And the Roman New Year began on March the 1st, which was at that time a new moon. Around 46 BC, there was a man, a mighty man, named Julius Caesar. Some people consider him to be a god in Rome. And Julius Caesar took the advice of an astronomer by the name of Sosigenes to remove the moon from calculating the Roman calendar. He took that advice and went with a strictly solar calendar for Rome. Booted the moon out entirely. And he moved the new year from March the 1st to January the 1st. And the reason he did it, there was one reason he did it, it was to honor the Roman deity named Janus. There's an old Roman poet by the name of Ovid that wrote a treatise on about half of the year. And he talks about this in his poetry. So Janus had two faces. This deity had two faces. He had one to take out the old year. And by the time the old year was ending, Janus had grew a beard. But then, when the new year began, Janus was clean shaven, right? So Janus definitely wasn't Hebrew, at least when he began the year. Right? <laughs> Maybe when he ended it, looked like one at least. Looked like a Hebrew. So Janus was often worshipped at birthdays and funerals, beginnings, endings. He was considered the god of gates and doors because gates and doors swung both ways. You would enter by the door. You would leave by the door. And this is the reason This is the reason why people still celebrate the new year on January 1st. I understand people don't know a lot about this, but this is where it stems from. Worship of the deity Janus and Julius Caesar's great exaltation of this deity. Some people have asked me, Brother Matthew, should we recognize the pagan calendar at all? Not for holy times. It should be completely discarded when it comes to our worship and service to Yahweh. When I'm deciding on which days or times are appointed by Yahweh, I do not look to any other calendar as my basis. I only look to His heavenly lights the best that I know how. But I don't believe that that means we have to go to an extreme and think that we can't use the pagan calendar for secular purposes. When I talk to my customers about doing some work for them, I don't tell them, well, I'll be out there on the 11th day of the fourth moon. And then they hang up and say, that company's crazy, we're going to call another company. (laughs) I tell them I'm going to be out there on, let's say, Wednesday. I realize that Wednesday is named after the god Woden, but I'm not using that terminology when I speak that as a form of invocation or worship. So I'm not memorializing that name in regards to my worship. Exodus 23.13 says, Make no mention of the name of other deities, neither let them be heard out of your mouth. Then we have a great prophet like Elijah that says, If Yahweh be Elohim, serve him. And he said, If Baal or Baal be Elohim, serve him. So he used the name of the other God, but he wasn't using it in a form of to invoke or to worship. So as I'm teaching tonight, I'm using the word Janus or the word Woden but I'm using it in a common way to downgrade those deities. And actually, when we use these names in a common way and not in an invocation or worshipful way, it's actually a slap in the face of a deity like Janus or Woden. In conclusion, Exodus 12, 1 through 2 teaches us that Yahweh has a way of measuring time. And it is of such importance to Him that He gives a command to His people as when to begin their new year and when to keep the Passover. And we must do our best to follow Yahweh. And I'll say this as I close. When you do your best to follow Yahweh, don't look down on other believers that do their best to follow Yahweh, but come to a different conclusion than you. Because it might turn out, just like I found out one time and may find out again, that I believed I was in error before, even though I thought I was right. We must do our best to follow Yahweh. It matters to Yahweh, so it should matter to us, His people. I thought today how that, you know, a lot of people would hear a teaching like this and think, that just doesn't, I don't think it matters a whole lot. And I thought, what would Moses and Aaron think if you tried to tell them that what Yahweh said about 
the year and the month, the moon and the sun and all of that. What if, what if you told Moses and Aaron, I just don't think that's really that important. I think we need to focus more on love. Listen, I agree that we need to focus on love, but this is part of the love message. This is part of the love message, how we love Yahweh. We talk, talk a lot about how we are to love our neighbor. That's part of the love message too. I believe in that. But a lot of times loving Yahweh gets put on the back burner. And we don't focus on how to love Yahweh. The commandments that go from us to Yahweh. So when these special times come up, and I, I, I'm of the persuasion, this is just an opinion, I'm of the persuasion that Passover is the greatest day of the year. Most important special day of the year. And when, when Passover rolls around, or Pentecost, or Feast of Tabernacles, everything else should get put to the wayside. And we focus on Yahweh and loving Him. We remember these great events in the history of Israel, but we focus on our worship and our service to Him in these days. So, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and next week we'll begin to go over the instructions for the Passover animal.